step-by-step self-discipline and effort to work with all the various levels of our being, the eight limbs of yoga, we gradually bring the mind to a meditative state. And if I refer back to the earlier analogy, we don't have to uh, wrestle with the stormy weather in the mind. Because actually the approach is rather than trying to fix the thoughts, we simply redirect the mind into an uplifting focal point, right? into a, our consciously chosen focal point. Even the practice of Hatha Yoga that so many of you are engaged in this weekend. We're consciously engaging the mind as fully as possible in the present, in the movement. And by doing so, we're withdrawing the mind from all the other movement. Gurdjieff have mentioned a pendulum. And I was talking with the group earlier this week about how when we direct the mind in a conscious way and withdraw our energy, <coughs> from the momentum of thought that already exists, right, it's as if a pendulum is no longer being pushed in the mind, and that pendulum gradually slows down without any new energy coming in to push it, it gradually slows down. And probably anyone that's tried to meditate regularly knows that the pendulum can go on for quite a long time <laughs> without slowing down. But it does. And even a little bit of that pendulum slowing down is a great relief to the mind. What a nice experience. And that's why we're motivated to keep practicing. Because there's a little bit of freedom from all of this thinking, thinking, thinking. So that's one path. By regular practice over a long period of time, as it says in the Yoga Sutras, it's possible to move in that direction in a steady way. And to be inspired by the taste of that freedom from thinking. The bliss of the non-toothache. Little bits. Then the path of bhakti yoga, Gurudev spoke of already. The path is surrender. Some years ago, probably from my own desperate moments, I realized how the practice of prayer and praying for guidance is so much similar to meditation. Gurdjieff right, kind of touched on this in a way when he said that through bhakti yoga, through surrender, we're acknowledging the limitations of our mind to know the truth, to know the answer. If you're like me, I tend to pray more when I'm desperate. Because right? I'm, I'm sort of more naturally drawn toward Raja Yoga put my effort into Raja Yoga, and with all my effort to control the mind, when it finally kind of literally brings me to my knees, I, then I'm praying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Raja Yoga eventually brings you. <laughs> you think you're getting somewhere, and then, it, then you get exposed to the truth. So in prayer, you acknowledge the limitations of this mind to know the answer, because you're trying everything the mind can come up with, right? and then you're saying, is there anything else in there? <laughs> and eventually you realize that you need something beyond this limited mind. And I can remember those moments when I had to surrender and give up on trying to figure things out and just pray for guidance. But the beautiful thing is, that same action has the same effect on the mind. Because we tried all the thinking we could do, we finally give up on it, we finally turn away from it, and we finally open ourselves to receive guidance from somewhere else other than that mind and those thoughts. We've heard those thoughts a hundred times before. Right? Give me something else right, for a change. So the same effect occurs. We kind of withdraw our energy from the thinking mind and all of those thoughts and we open ourselves to receive something else that's beyond the mental level. It's a beautiful experience. And that, of course, that's something else, whatever form that it comes in, whatever way you call for it, 
it's always beautiful. It, there's always an answer. Right? I never got a burning bush or a voice from the heavens, but I always got some kind of answer. And Gurdjieff didn't speak about jnana yoga, but, but he often does. Right? He kind of did for a second when he said, uh, I'm not even here, right? He was kind of intentionally separating himself from the vehicle that his own spirit is using in this life. Remember he said the speaker. It's like the speaker. The speaker doesn't move around. The speaker is just there. Something comes through it. So in Yana Yoga, yet another path, we consciously discriminate between that which is our spiritual self and that which is not. And since that which is our spirit is not so easily known, we, mo we focus mostly on remembering what we're not. <laughs> Remi reminding ourselves, I'm not this body, I'm not this mind, and all of these thoughts I'm having, I'm not these thoughts either. And I'm not this other thought and this other thought. I had this kind of striking experience with Yana Yoga once. <clears throat> My main Yana Yoga experience. And I think it was, it was when I was living in San Francisco, IYI, so that would be back in the late 1980s. Whenever you tell an embarrassing story, you have to make it a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I've come way beyond it. So in this story, uh, there were a few Swamis visiting the Institute in San Francisco, where I was living. And we decided on a Sunday evening to watch a, a movie for entertainment. The people living at the Institute and these visiting Kwamis, right? And I try to make sure that when we do that, which we do occasionally, that we start the film early enough that we end before evening meditation. Right? Because sometimes even people from outside the Institute would join us for the evening meditation. Right? But because of the guests and the extra time it took to pick something out that everybody wanted to watch, you know, the situation. Uh, we got started late. And I knew from the beginning that it was going to happen eventually. Meditation was going to arrive and the movie was still going to be playing and then we'd be faced with this whole dynamic. What do we do? Right. So, of course, if the movie's not good, it doesn't matter too much. <laughs> so I was kind of wondering about that. And as the movie went on, I was seeing it was really fun. It was great. I was enjoying it. And I was kind of hoping, maybe nobody will come. And then those of us here can finish the movie and then meditate, right? When, when? Well, that didn't happen. And I was seeing how I was kind of interested in still watching the movie, if that could be possible somehow. What happened is a guest from outside the Institute came, but it was someone that was a member of the Sangha that we all knew very well. They came in the back door, right? They didn't even ring the doorbell. They just came in. and. They were very comfortable just coming in, and they sat down and began to watch the movie with us. So I thought, hmm, maybe, maybe they'll just watch the movie. <laughs> Even though they came for meditation. So, it's almost 9 o'clock, which was the meditation time. This person seems to be comfortably watching the movie. It looks like I might get away with it, right? But then the doorbell rang, and I knew it was all over. So there's a little bit of karma yoga here. It was sort of my duty to lead the evening meditation. Reluctantly, I went to the door and opened it, and somebody said, is there evening meditation? I said, of course. Of course. There's always evening meditation. And I went upstairs with this person, and the other person who came, she left the movie also, went upstairs. So the three of us meditated. And the first thing that happened to me up there, I was sitting there, my eyes closed, thinking, I guess this makes me look pretty good compared to those other swamis. <laughs> <laughs> They're down there watching a movie. <laughs> what kind of discipline is that? <laughs> this is going on for a little while. <laughs> You've been there, right? <laughs> and you know, finally, I kind of. I woke up to what was happening. I was like, oh God. <laughs> yeah. There was the me that felt like I had to go into the door and had to leave meditation. There was the me that wanted to watch the movie. Then there was the me that was proud of going up there. <laughs> and 
finally I had my Yana Yoga moment, and I just thought, oh my God, I don't want to be any of those. <laughs> and I actually had this kind of physical experience where I felt like I was taking all of those thought forms, boxing them up, taking them out, and putting them down in front of the altar. Now that was kind of the bhakti part of the story. Please, <laughs> you take these. <laughs> And I actually had a nice meditation. Yeah, I felt like, oh, what a, what a relief to be free of all that. Right? All of that drama that went on. I wasn't even fully present for the movie. And actually, the experience of the meditation was so nice that when we were finished, I wasn't even that keen to watch the movie anymore. I saw a whole other picture show in my mind. That's, that kind of experience stuck with me, was so striking, just to see that all of this stuff, all the stories that we tell ourselves, and all that we go through, measuring and judging and planning and, and scheming and putting a spin on things to position ourselves, for all in the name of trying to have a little bit of peace, right? when to be free of all of that is so much more peaceful. The last of the... Uh, the paths that I mentioned, the path of karma yoga, it's worth mentioning also, right? path of selfless service, that of letting go of all these thoughts about me, all the me-centered thinking, right? and instead finding joy in giving, serving others, which feels so natural, right? it feels so good when we actually find ourselves doing it. <clears throat> There's a whole world of influence telling us it's all about me where everyone's taking care of themselves. Right? So much of our culture, have it your way, is it, the same, right? It's your thing, right? do what you want to do. <laughs> it's a very lonely way of living, right? To, to be constantly thinking about me. Right? Then you're the only one. Right? Gurdjieff used to say it this way, right? If you're only thinking of yourself, there's just you thinking about you. But if you take care of others, and you serve others, then how many people will also want to be, to be taking care of you? And you live in this experience of connection, right? which feels so right, because it's our nature. We are ultimately all connected in that way. The reason I like that story that I told you is because it feels like it has a little element of all of these different paths, right? Some intention to do the right thing, to be of service. Some effort to practice, right? Many a time I came to the meditation cushion just so I could fulfill the duty of being there. But once I got there, somehow the mind was able to let go a little bit. And I was so grateful that I went. And then just the knowledge that we don't have to do it alone, right? that there is a higher power, there's a grace, there's a sangha, all of which can support us. Thank God for that. That's, that's again why I love coming here, to be with this family and see how there's a whole village of people right? that I can think of as supporters, as people that I love. So, I think those are the thoughts I wanted to share. That each of us, in whatever way we find most natural, that we seek or pursue that path, that we keep giving our energy to that path, and by directing our energy in a positive way, we devitalize that whole dimension of ourselves. That's an illusion, an illusion of the separate self. We turn the me into a we, and we find this unfailing compass inside of us. That's the beauty. Unfailing compass. The nature of the compass, it always points north, no matter what conditions. What a relief to know that, that each of us has a compass like that within us. So I pray for all of you that you are commitment to practice this weekend, to the stress management TTs over these last 10 days, that your
commitment bear the fruit of bringing you more and more in touch with that light within you. We had the beautiful ending to our training program thinking about how powerful it can be for all of us to be out in the world sharing this. And especially when I see teacher training programs over and over and over again, I think how beautiful it is that so many people absorbing these teachings are then spreading, spreading them out in the world. And of course, we won't ever see that in the newspaper. It doesn't make the news. But it is changing things. It is touching the lives of many, many people. So I pray for all of us that our path brings us in touch with that light, and our light touches many. Thank you.